Nice. How's the weather down there in Florida? Ah, uh, beautiful and sunny. <laughs> nice. We finally have sunny weather as well. It rained a, a good chunk of the day yesterday. We have a we have an expedition here. Hi, folks. Hello. Hi there. Good to see y'all. Good to see you, Billy. Good to be back. <laughs> we we've got an expedition here this week, and have a, about yeah, have thirteen people on the program, which is great. Wow. And we're, have uh have more people out tomorrow so um some uh kind of feels it's feel and we got like uh five um staff out at the site which is great so back on the yeah. <laughs> at long last <laughs> i'll be down there next week taylor you will looking for houses and stuff Oh my gosh, that's so exciting. <laughs> Kevin and little Ed will be with me too. So <laughs> hopefully it, I think it's supposed to stay sunny. So, <laughs> um, so I might see you. Yeah, that's, I, um, I leave Saturday for a job, but, uh, before then, if you want to grab, uh, drinks or lunch or something, I'd love to. Awesome. Mm. Thanks. And as you all come in to the uh, um, to the Zoom meeting, if you could mute, that would be a, a big help, just in case we have barking dogs or uh, anything else, which sometimes happens. <laughs> Hello, everybody. We're reaching the uh, the top of the hour here. Um, we'll let more people uh, filter in as we go, but just say a few words so you know that we're not locked up. So <laughs> good to good to see everybody here. And this week we got a, a busy week. We have an expedition here um, and doing excavations at the uh, the overseer's house. And this is the um, the the final expedition of the spring season, right before the field school arrives. So in 
you know, we've got uh, about four, 13 or 14 people out at the site, and plus a lot of returning uh, uh, staff who are going to be helping out with a field school or here, which is great. So have a full full staff get up. And what's even even better today, have Taylor back visiting, who's going to be uh, talking about subfloor pits with me today. So, but yeah, and we're at 1201, so we'll go ahead and uh, uh, get started. Um, uh, first, many of you all remember uh, Taylor Brown. She um, did the, the field school back in, gosh, it was 2019 or was that 18, Taylor? I think it was 2019. 2019 at the final aid, and then uh, stayed on as a uh, as an intern and then as a staff member and is now at the, uh, I was going to say the University of West Indies, University of West Florida, <laughs> close to there though, University of West Florida, uh, working on her, on her uh, master's. But when she, when Taylor was here, she did um, the beginning work and a lot of work uh, with Hannah James on digitizing all of the excavations we had done about 20 years ago in the cellar into GIS. So um, and she did a wonderful um, uh, study on the subfloor pits there. And so um, had the idea of having Taylor talk a little bit about that. And I, was, I wanted to, to, um, to be part of this as well, to talk about some of the uh, other subfloor pits we found across the, the property. And I, I don't know if you all have had a chance to look at Taylor's uh, blog, a story map she did um, uh, about a year ago on the subfloor pits. But this, this talk is, is following that theme of, you know, uh, love Taylor's name for this, just another hole in the ground. Is, is it just a hole or what is it? You know, how do we define what is uh, subfloor pits uh, in the archeological record? And with that, um, I will uh, let you jump into that discussion, Taylor. Do you wanna take it from here? Sounds good. Okay, so uh, we're talking about subfloor pits, and like Matt said, uh, they quite literally are just holes in the ground, um, but when we come across them, uh, they can tell us a lot about the people who once used them, and so we're going to go through kind of a bunch of different examples of subfloor pits from across Montpelier's property to really explore how different and unique they can be and how we figure out what they were once used for. Um, so kind of just to start as a history, uh, subfloor pits are just uh, holes dug in the ground. They were used for many purposes. So we have clay borrow pits, storage spaces, uh, places where things were hidden or concealed. There were food storage and they um, have even been found evidence that they were used as spiritual spaces. Um, and a lot of the earliest examples of subfloor pits in the U.S. on uh, plantation sites um, correspond directly with the increasing um, enslaved population. And so a lot of this research points to subfloor pits as these really unique adapt adaptations that enslaved populations uh, use to kind of create their own living space and shape it to what they needed or what they wanted. Um, and so uh, we're gonna go through a couple of them using the IMLS grant uh, map, di the digitized map that um, Hannah and I started and has since been built on. Um, so I think Matt, we can share that so people can get to seeing what uh, kind of digitizing was able to show us. Yeah, and you all should be able to see the, uh, the screen now of the map, everybody can see that. And I'm gonna let go of my mouse now, Taylor, so we don't have mice fighting. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, right. I'm gonna approve. So I've approved you using the mouse, yes. There we go. Um, so this, let's see if it'll let me move that around. There we go. Um, so this aerial photo uh, is very familiar to me, but might not be to you guys. And this is um, the main part of Montpelier. And so you can see in the center, um, that's the horse racing track. Um, and then, oh, I want to zoom out too much. So this is the where the uh, hunt races happen. This right here, this uh, gray complex is the visitor center. And then right in here, we have um, the main house. And then over this way is the archaeology building. Um, but we have this whole 
the whole property uh, digitized in this map. And so versus instead of like a PowerPoint or something, Matt and I are going to use this to kind of explore the, the different subfloor pits um, and what they were used for and how we found them and use clues to discover what they were um, created for. And so first, I think, Matt, you're going to take us to the stable quarters um, and the field quarters and talk about the subfloor pits there. Yes, absolutely. Um, and yeah, for for um, the area, one of the really the first areas that we found uh, really um, a classic example of a subfloor pit is in a uh, quarter that we found a home for an enslaved family right beside the main house. So here's the main house right here uh, that you all are uh, uh, familiar, familiar with. Um, and uh, getting the right building right here. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, there's the main house right there. Uh, the south yard is right in this area. This is a, a view of the um, the south yard as it's restored today. And then here's the what we call um, the stable quarter uh, and, and sometimes called Granny Millie's cabin based on an account from the early 19th century. Um, and um, for for the area of this log structure, we excavated this area a number of, of years ago. And what we found at this site was a series of, um, of features that really helped us understand what this area was. So this is a shot of the stable quarter uh, back in 2010. This is before the South Yard was built. Um, and the, uh, the uh, where the duplexes are today, the quarters for um, uh, for enslaved uh, um, house servants. You've, you had these trees in this area. And one of the first buildings that we fully excavated around the main house was this structure that was defined not by chimney bases, but by these brick horrors that bookend either end of the structure. And then right in the right beside one of these hearths was this square pit which is a classic subfloor pit. And being given the, the reason why we know this is a subfloor pit in this case is it's between these two chimneys, which means it's inside a structure. And then also what defines these subfloor pits, especially when you find them in an area where you don't know where the house is, the structure is, is the square sides. So if we um, go into a closer version of this, this is uh, Hope Smith excavating this subfloor pit same one that's shown right here. Um, what you can see is it's got these this very square shape. And if, if this was in the yard of a um, of a uh, of of a um, a log structure, erosion would have rounded off the side. So you can see an example of this in uh, this um, this shot right here. These shot these two features A and B are what we call borrow pits. And we're gonna be talking a little bit about that later uh, with uh, some of the work we did at, at the uh, um, Civil War encampment. But when you find these squared off, you know you're inside a structure because they would have been protected. And then what we found almost exclusively in all of these is a heavy layer of ash that it, again, if this was exposed to the weather, a lot of this ash would be uh, washed away or mixed with uh, um, with silt deposits. But it's evident that you know as soon as the uh, the structure collapsed on top of this or was abandoned, you know there was a rapid generation of vegetation that protected these uh, these sites. And so one one thing that with the subfloor pit with the ash that we've been considering is there's like Taylor said there's all kinds of interpretations about these subfloor pits. Um, and one, uh, there's an account from Frederick Douglass, Fre Frederick Douglass about his childhood, and he recalls uh, uh, what his grandmother would call a sweet potato hole, which would be a, 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 a pit dug right beside the hearth inside the structure um, to store sweet potatoes for the wintertime. And they were dug close to the hearth because with sweet potatoes, you want to keep them warm and dry. And this, the, the best place for this is right beside the hearth. And in the case of sweet potatoes, they're going to be attractive to, you know, mice and to insects. And we're, we're thinking that the ash being stored in this would have stored, served two different purposes. One would be that it would um, make it not a nice environment for uh, insects and mice. 
but then and it also would have helped preserve these sweet potatoes and there's a West African tradition of rolling yams and ash to preserve them uh, in storage. But then we also find a lot of artifacts in these. And this is where archaeologists have gotten into all kinds of interpretations of these spaces as storage spaces. And in the case of the what we had found at the stable quarter um, in this subfloor pit, which is quite a bit larger than the other ones that we, we found in other places, this subfloor pit had all kinds of um, in, uh, hardware, such as hinges. We found tools, a lot of ceramics. And it, it's some of these items, uh, like the we found an ax in this, in this um, subfloor pit, seem to be that it could have been used for storage. But then there's a lot of animal bone from, you know, from meals and also broken ceramics. This suggests that in the process of depositing hearth ash that you know, household waste was thrown into this as well. That would have been dry waste that would have been, you know, burned in the fire. So there's a there's a lot to interpret about these, but these are very important spaces for the for the enslaved community. Um, so from from this site right here, from the uh, the stable quarter, um, what we'll do is move a little bit further out. And Taylor, I'll talk about the context at the uh, the um, at the at the home farm. For what we found there next, Sounds and, good. For, and for the for the soon after we did excavations at the uh, the stable quarter in 2012 and 2013, we began excavations at what we call the home farm today. And the home farm is an area that most of you all are very familiar with. This is the area in the fields below the visitor center, and one of the most you know prominent features that are out there that visitors can see today are the locations of these structures that are these homes that now we believe are more than likely homes for the skilled artisans that are working at the home farm, especially the blacksmith, which is right beside um, uh, these, uh, these log buildings. And how we were able to identify these log buildings is by none other than the subfloor pits. And when you look at the, um, the these, this site here, when we were doing excavations in this area, one of the most prominent features that we found were these squared off pits. And when you look at um, the area, a, a much larger area, let me get to this map right here. We opened up a large area across this, um, this locale based on concentrations of artifacts, what we found through shovel test pits. And we found two locations. This this area here and the area right here with one of these squared off pits. And what, again, what these indicated is that we had found an area of, you know, what was a subfloor pit. And um, given that square shape, it was under a structure. And that's what, you know, we as archaeologists want to find is by defining where the structure is, we can figure out how everything else relates to it. And in this case, these subfloor pits are really important for understanding this space because what we didn't find in the area of the um, of the field quarter uh, was any evidence for the chimneys. There is no uh, brick platform for either the hearth or any kind of base for masonry base for the chimney because these are more than likely stick and mud chimneys. So these subfloor pits not only gave us an idea of where the structure was, but also gave us an idea where the hearth would have been. And that's how when we did the um, did our, our analysis of this space, what we're able to do is to understand um, you know, where, where the, uh, the structures would be. So in the case of, of this, this subfloor pit right here, we interpreted based on the, our artifact scatter that the chimney would have been in this area, the subfloor pit here, and then this structure located right here. And in the case of this subfloor pit, based on the downslope area and the trash deposits that were downslope in this direction to the uh, to the south, we interpreted the structure being in this area. And there was actually also a drip line. And if you look at the map, when I zoom in here, you can see either these features. Here's the uh, the subfloor pit right here, outlined in yellow. Here's this erosional uh, trench that we think was right beside the structure. And then we think this structure sat right here. And that's why when we did the reconstructions of this area, you know, we located the, this, uh, the log structure um, where we did. And uh, here's a little better picture 
of um of the uh the this the subfloor pit that's down in um in this area right here so with this structure right here where we found this subfloor pit was at a 90 degree angle to the slope and that gave us an idea of the orientation of the structure in this location and that's what allowed us to really begin to place these structures on the landscape so in this aerial photograph right here what you can see is um th uh this structure um uh right here is oriented at a 90 degree structure to this building right here and that's based on the position of these of these subfloor pits that we located and what was a little different about some, some of these subfloor pits was that um the subfloor pit that we found in this area right here uh this structure right here this subfloor pit turned out to have a very different structure than any of the other ones we had found. This one, you notice there's this charred material. This is a this is the subfloor uh, pit that we bisected. But before we bisected this, all the bottom of this was covered by this burn material that had almost what looked to be a basket weave. So we're thinking there might have been some kind of um, maybe a oak, an oak basket that lined this subfloor pit for uh, 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 keeping the, uh, the vegetables contained and also keeping the sides of the pit um, intact. And then this was, was burned um, in situ to provide some sort of structure. So there's a, a lot of questions we have about this subfloor pit. It had some interesting features. And then this other subfloor pit that we found up here, this one was interesting because you notice there's two subfloor pits here. There's this larger subfloor pit and then there's another one that intrudes into this one, this the uh, the later dating subfloor pit. So it goes through multiple generations of, of use. And one one thing that's unique about the subfloor pits we found both at, you know, all the ones we've found so far at the um uh in homes for the enslaved that date to the to the early 19th century, is all of these structures appear to only have one subfloor pit. And that tends to suggest that there is only one household occupying these structures uh, because um, archaeologists that have done work in the tidewater on earlier 18th century homes have found structures this size that will have upwards of six or seven or eight subfloor pits that indicate there are multiple individuals living in these spaces and potentially multiple a subfloor pit for every person within the household. And so this is helping this really gave us you know a, an idea that the homes for the enslaved of Montpelier were more than likely one household uh one unified household per structure and that's something we're going to continue to analyze as we you know move and, and do some of our work now one of the last things I'm going to uh wanted to show was one of the earlier subfloor pits that we located and this is over at Mount Pleasant so at Mount Pleasant this is the um, the uh, um, the home of uh, James Madison's grandmother, uh, Frances uh, uh, Madison, and the main house, which is shown in this painting that we did about uh, 20 years ago now, based on the archaeology, is this structure right here with um, what what we found was a, a cellar hole for the main part of the structure, and if you look in this shot right here, let me zoom in here. I think I've got. Let's see if the um, archaeology is going to turn on here. Oh, I got them off. There it is right there. So if you look at um, this shot right here, this is a photograph of the main house in terms of what we found with the archaeology. And this large cellar, cellar hole right here was under this structure that is uh, shown in this image right here. Let's see, this, this image right here, this, the cellar hole we found is under the main part of the structure right here. And this is the subterranean entrance right here. And so this is showing this, this is the cellar hole as we found it through the archeology. span And what you'll notice off to the side here 
is this rather shallow but large subfloor pit that's nearly eight feet by six feet. And this is how we interpreted the structure that's shown in this image right here to having this potential shed extension, because again, this subfloor pit is squared off and it would have been under a structure and it's close enough to this cellar hole that it gave us an idea that there was a shed addition, which is pretty typical of early um, 18th century uh, planter houses of the, of the time period. So, but in this case, what the question is, is of course, this is the Madison family home. You've got a subfloor pit over here. Could this be a chamber that one of the, um, the, the enslaved individuals working in the main house was living in? Or was this a subfloor pit associated with the, the, um, the Madison family? So there's a, a lot of questions about this. And this, you know, the association of this subfloor pit with the main house right here really um, dovetails nice with what uh, Taylor's going to talk about next with subfloor pits that we literally found inside the main house during our um, excavations there. And I'm going to close out so many of these windows. I've got open Taylor, so and I'll not close out the map. And so you can get back to something that's a little more, more sane. I'll zoom out a little bit. All right. So I'll take control of the mouse again, uh, and we'll zoom back in to the main house. Um, so the first thing, I'm going to talk about three different types of um, primary subfloor pits that we really found. Um, and the first one I'm going to talk about is one that if you've been to the mere distinction of color exhibit, you're probably pretty familiar with. And it is a vegetable kiln. Um, let's see. Scoot this map down. So this subfloor pit, uh, like we were talking about before, um, is probably one of the biggest uh, that you're familiar with. You've probably seen pictures. Um, so this is a one of our one of a former archaeology archaeologists at Montpelier excavating it. So you can see how just how giant this is. Um, and so this vegetable kiln uh, was discovered in the cellar spaces. It's super deep um, and evidence in the sides of the feature wall show um, like wood was left in the sides. And so it's been interpreted that it was probably dug down, uh, filled with a barrel similar to the um, field quarters that had we hypothesized might have had a basket set into it. So this one had a barrel set, might have had a barrel set into the subfloor pit. And then again, was used as uh, it's interpreted as a root cellar. And so again, that cold dry storage, um, like uh, the Frederick Douglass uh, memory of a uh, sweet potato hole. Um, and so this subfloor pit, uh, you can see, at the bottom, I don't know if we have more photos of it. Um, what can often make it hard to interpret subfloor pits is uh, once it's done being used, it's filled back in with dirt and not necessarily with the things that it was filled with during its life. And so actually in the subfloor pit, when archaeologists got down to the bottom of it, uh, there's a great picture of like a shovel head and a couple of wine bottle bases and all of this uh, debris that likely after the subfloor pit had kind of run its course as a vegetable kiln, um, they filled it back in with trash. And so that that's what you initially find when you come down on these subfloor pits and you have to be able to recognize uh, what was used to fill in the hole after it was done and then look for other clues to kind of figure out what was this during its actual lifetime. Um, and I'm sure, Matt, if, since you were actually there during the excavation, if you ever want to interject, uh, like finding personal stories of what was at the bottom of these subfloor pits, that'd be super cool. Yeah, Taylor, this one is really exciting because I um, there's actually when I worked at Manassas Battlefield, we found a, a one that was similar to this at the Sudley Post Office, and there was a um, a elderly lady that I interviewed in the '90s about these kind of uh, pits, and she described it as being called a, a vegetable kiln, and this these vegetable kilns a lot of times would be in the yard away from the 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 house. And um, basically meant to be below the frost line. And when you think about, when you look at the uh, the cellar in this area, I'm gonna, um, if it's all right, uh, Taylor, I'm gonna bring up one shot. I, I'm hoping I can find it of the, um, yeah, 
Um, this is a shot of the uh, of the 1797 cellar uh, before we did the restoration, but after the archaeology was done, is this cellar was this large space with only one hearth, but this hearth was chopped through in the 18 teens uh, to allow a, a, a the creation of a, a support for the uh, the chimney up above, and what happened with this space is this space would have been in the winter time essentially cold storage and the the fact that this subfloor pit is in this cold storage area suggests that this would have been more like a vegetable kiln so instead of keeping sweet potatoes you would have kept irish potatoes apples carrots and onions in in this sort of storage pit and we've we've got samples that um, we we still have a need we we should be sending out for uh, for uh, starch analysis on this and it would be really exciting to under you know see if there's evidence for that and what I love about that shovel we had found Taylor is we found when we did the excavations we found that the um the, the it must have been that the wooden floor had rotted by the 1880s and so they had leveled it out to put in a, a new wooden floor. And in part, and so that shovel might have broken during these 1880s renovations, and then the soil was thrown in there, um, you know, just to, you know, clean the area up. So, very cool. All right. And then uh, our next type of subfloor pit, uh, you've seen a few of these, the rectangular subfloor pits and these other pictures. Uh, these we've been interpreted as uh, ash pits. Uh, so like Matt said, ash uh, had a lot of different uses. Um, it was a bug and a um, like mouse deterrent that you would collect and then sprinkle in places you didn't want creepy crawlies to get into. Um, what was really cool when we were digitizing the cellar spaces, uh, we would digitize root runs and or root mm. runs and rodent runs. And so in all of these rodent runs and the cellar spaces, a lot of the stratigraphy notes noted that there were inclusions or charred wood inclusions and so maybe they were collecting all this ash in these subfloor pits and then when they noticed a mouse burrow they would go in and sprinkle all this collected ash in these places to kind of deter further pest invasion um but where were where were you getting all this ash and uh it's interpreted that people would go through the main house and sweep out uh, the hearth spaces into these buckets. And that's where you would get all of these, so these broken ceramics, this debris that was kind of broken in the main house spaces, discarded into the um, hearth areas, swept out and then brought down to these ash pits to be collected and kind of stored um, for further use. And so that's why as you go through these ash pits in the cellar spaces, not only are we finding ash inclusions and charred wood inclusions, but you get all of these hearth sweepings as well. And so you have broken ceramics, there are quite a few um, concentrations of like uh, discarded faunal bone, stuff like that in these ash pits. Um, and so on the map, you can see that there's one here. This is another one. Uh, again, so this is a great picture where you can really see evidence of that charred wood and ash um, as they're excavating. And then the other one is up in this corner. We'll highlight it. Let's see if it lets me click. There we go. Mm. And um, this was a really interesting ash pit um, because in the very back corner of it, they found this uh, glass vial uh, kind of set directly in this back corner, like someone had purposely um, put it there. And I'll let Matt talk a little bit about um, that because he's actually written a whole paper on it, which is where I pulled much of my information. Um, but it shows that these subfloor pits aren't just like one side, one purpose fits all, that they were used for different things at different times, different things at the same time. Um, and so I'll let Matt go into a little bit about the story of this little medicine bottle that was recovered. Yeah, this um, little medicine bottle is barely noticeable in um, the uh, um, in the north northern corner. This is if you all remember, north is up on this map. So this is literally the north corner of the main house. And um, I don't know if I've got a, a picture of this. I don't, let me see in this, in this shot right here, 
the, the, this little vial was found just in the corner right here. And what was in this vial was not just charred wood, but pulverized charred wood. It's like it had, it had been intentionally ground and placed in there as a black substance. And the fact that you got this vial, you know, that was intact at one time, and when the floor was redone, either in the early 20th century or the late um, 19th century, the top of this vial was clipped off because this was standing upright in the corner. So it wasn't, it wasn't thrown in there as trash. It was intentionally placed. We believe there's some sort of uh, spiritual significance to this, whether it's for protection for the folks working down in this area or, you know, some sort of, um, you know, something else for, for, for this space. And one thing that we was really kind of unusual about these subfloor pits um, in these spaces, the three that Taylor just pointed out, is while they did have trash in them, the, when we did the water screening of the ash deposits, what we didn't find was any eggshell or in the charred material, any orga um, charred organic food waste, which was the total opposite of what we found in the subfloor pits that we excavated in the uh, the quarters for enslaved households. In those, like in the in the uh, stable quarter and out at the field quarter, those subfloor pitch, the ash deposits that we water screened, and then when we sent the charred material out for paleobotanical analysis, we found you know hundred there's hundreds of of charred seeds from raspberry to uh, bean seeds, and with the the ash that was found in these, you know like what you're saying, Taylor, there was no kitchen debris, no evidence that there was the kind of kitchen debris that would be thrown into a heart. Say, you know, if you're if you're making uh, some sort of um, raspberry uh, 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 recipe and you're straining out the seeds and you're right by the fireplace, what do you do with the seeds? The best place, I mean, this, you do this when you're at, at doing a campfire as well, is you throw all that debris into the into the fireplace. And what's beautiful about fresh organic debris, especially seeds being thrown into the fireplace, is that with if you have a like a dried corn cob, it's going to burn. But if you have a fresh corn cob, it's not going to burn. It's going to char in a low heat fire like you would have in a fireplace. Because remember, you're not going to have a roaring fire in your fireplace like you have in a campfire. Because if you do, your house is going to catch on fire. It's it's not good. I remember as a boy doing that and getting in big big trouble. So with these smaller scale fires, these wet these fresh organic materials char. But we don't find any food organic waste in these three subfloor pits in the cellar, which is what gave us, you know, the, the idea, like Taylor was mentioning, that these are coming from hearths inside the house, you know, bedrooms, the dining dining room, the um, the uh, the drawing room, and they're part of the domestic complex of Montpelier, but not the kitchen, the working area of the uh, of the kitchen, and that's where. The, um, like you were mentioning, Taylor, the, these um, some of the rodent runs that we located, like this is my favorite one. This was just, we called this uh, 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 the mouse village. This is in the very corner of the northern uh, cellar kitchen. So this kitchen, let me see if I've got a, um, a picture of this area. Oh, shoot. Let me see. I don't have a picture of the whole of the whole kitchen, but this being in the corner, it was under a stair. And so this was not only full of these rodent runs, but like you mentioned, Taylor, it's full of all this ash debris, but this ash debris had all kinds of kitchen waste, all kinds of charred seeds, uh, eggshell, uh, which is very different from the other, other subfloor pits. So, um, Let's see. So you got 1797, and then we didn't we didn't find any subfloor pits in these cellar spaces, or in the in the brick cellar, the the floor, the the kitchen cellars that had brick floors. Um, but I'll let you take over the mouse operation from here. Speaking of mice, take over the mouse <laughs> operation, Taylor. All right, and then the last category of subfloor pits that we'll talk about um, in the cellar space are these two uh, water sumps. Um, and so we have two separate ones that really are two really incredible examples of how archaeology helps us track down when exactly these uh, holes in the ground became holes in the ground. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about is this sump right over here, um, the circular feature. Again, 
pretty big. Uh, if you had previously excavated a vegetable kiln, you might be looking at this and thinking, hmm, that could be a second vegetable kiln. Um, but as archaeologists were working on this, uh, they found all these clues that pointed to the fact that it was likely a water sump instead of a kiln. Um, and so some of those, I think we have a good picture. Um, Taylor, are you looking for the arched opening? Yeah, yep. Yeah, let me see if I can find that. I just realized I, that might be something I'll have to add. <laughs> so shoot. Um, utility lines, drainage. Yeah, I nope, can just- that one ahead. is broken. Let me try one more. Let me see if you can see it. Oh, it's so hard to see. It's right here. <laughs> But it, it's a yeah, it's an arched opening that these bricks that are right here are a, a linear drain feature that go out of the house and drain to daylight. Yep. And so archaeologists found this subfloor pit and then linked that up with this arched feature in the side of the wall that goes through the wall outside the house attached to this drainage pit. Um, and so likely this uh, sump was created to kind of shuttle water out of this cellar space that probably flooded quite a bit uh, if they found it necessary to create this whole sump and um, um, drainage sy system. But what's super cool is on the outside of the house, as they were finding, uh, recovering this uh, drainage line, it was excavated beneath a layer of stucco. Um, and from the historical record, this stucco we know was put on the house around 1848. And so in archeology, span the deeper something is, uh, the older it is. And so this drainage, uh, ditch was found beneath this 1848 layer of stucco. Um, so likely it's attached sump in the cellar spaces was built around 1848. There we go. There's a great picture. Um, and so you can kind of very faintly see where that line goes out. Um, and that helps us date the sump feature prior to 1848. Um, and so obviously pretty early on, they were dealing with drainage and coming up with ways to kind of get that water out of the cellar space. There you go, Taylor. I remembered where that, that image was, so. Perfect. Um, and so that uh, subfloor pit is a water sump that prior to 1848 was built and kind of shuttled water out of the cellar. Um, and then later on, um, we're still having the same issue. We're still having flooding in the cellar space. And so uh, they created a second uh, water sump, but this one has a completely different story. Um, so at the bottom of this rectangular feature, uh, subfloor pit, they found a giant stone slab. Um, and I think there's probably another picture where it shows the slab in place. Um, but that slab, as they were doing renovations, um, I might let Matt maybe look for that picture of a slab uh, while I tell the story. And so they excavate down to the bottom of the subfloor pit. They find this giant rectangular slab. Um, and one of the masons that's also a part of the restoration project recognizes it as the same kind of stones that reportedly um, James Madison Sr. ordered in from England as hearthstones. Um, and so this mason recognizes this in the bottom. They're able to pull the stone up and actually match the chisel marks on the bottom of the stone to the bed of mortar in the drawing room upstairs. And so suddenly we've relocated uh, this original um, hearthstone that had been ordered by James Madison Sr. put in one drawing room. I think it was moved to another room when the uh, drawing room was split in two. And then uh, when the Madisons left the property and they were whoever bought it was still dealing with all of this flooding in the cellar, created the sump and used it as a kind of bottom stone in the sump to stop um, mud from getting into the water. And so relocating that stone, we're able to realize that this sump was built prior or after the Madisons left the property when the stone was removed from the drawing room, um, which again, these two separate uh, subfloor pits had all these little clues that helped us date exactly um, when they were created. And we can kind of see that continuous problem of flooding in the cellar space that through time people have had to deal with in different ways.
Yeah, and doing the with the work on the cellar is what was great about the excavations in this space is with the house being restored at the same time as we were doing the excavations, we were able to work with the masons on understanding like what what you were talking about, um, Taylor, was this this stone that we found. It's a um it's a it's a sandstone from uh, England, and uh, it is the same sandstone is used in the hearth surrounds in the 1765 portion of the main house. And so that's where the masons were able to match this exactly. And then like you were talking about Taylor, the movement of these stones, the um, having the masons, you know, when you restore a house, you get to know every single detail in a very intimate way. And so when we would find bricks, when we'd find mortar, when we'd find stucco, we could actually have the masons date them based on the inclusions that were in the in the stucco or in the mortar, and that gave us a date for all of these features in the cellar. So, if if for some reason the main house had burned, say during the Civil War, there would be it would have been very difficult to make the interpretations that we made with the with the cellar spaces. And this gave us a really good context for beginning to understand you know how these subfloor pits are used. Yeah, so that's kind of all um, in the mansion spaces. Um, we'll zoom out really quickly to kind of talk about um, a different type of subfloor pit, and then we'll round it out with kind of returning back to the overseers, which is currently being excavated. Um, so we'll zoom out from the main house, and we'll go up and across the way to the McGowan encampment. Oh, <laughs> zoom in the wrong way. <laughs> All right. I could help you, Taylor. Get there. Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> yeah, because I know exactly where this this uh, image is. Yeah, and this what what uh, Taylor's going to talk about um, next is more along the the lines of what is or isn't a subfloor pit with some of these barrow pits. And there's the uh, the encampment right there. Yeah, and so like we've talked about before. Um, the shape of subfloor pits can be really helpful in figuring out where they were, what they were. Um, and so like in the field slave quarters, we had these really straight sided subfloor pits that were likely inside structures. So they were protected from the elements, kept with these nice straight walls. Um, and then all of these super rounded subfloor pits that aren't quite subfloor pits were likely outside structures. And an example at the McGowan camp and so you have these um, rounded pits uh, that are actually borrow pits, clay borrow pits. And so at the encampment, when they were building these um, wood cabins, they needed clay to use for chinking between the wood. And so instead of going somewhere really far away and bringing clay in, they actually just dug clay pits borrowing the clay um, from right beside the structures and use that um, to kind of build the wooden cabins and the chinking between the logs. Um, and so again, the shape of subfloor pits, what we find in them, uh, what we find right on the, the cut of the feature, so their very edges, um, kind of is all of the hints that archaeologists use to kind of figure out what they were uh, being used for when they were being used by the people who built them and made them. Um, and so these have kind of been a whole bunch of different examples of subfloor pits across Montpelier um, and also examples of not subfloor pits from across Montpelier. Um, so I'll give mouse control back to Matt and then um, we can talk about the overseer's site. Yeah, so with this as a kind of a, of a guideline, you, like it, for example, with, like, uh, Taylor was talking about you've got these rounded features right here that are they're they're not subfloor pits because they're not below a structure so they're not uh they're just yeah they're uh, you, not subfloor pits so instead of subfloor pits I have a whole new definition they're rounded and they're outside of the building which is important and right now I, like Taylor mentioned we're excavating at the overseer's house and the overseer's house is this site that uh we know about from uh, an 1848 uh, or 1844 plat, and it shows the overseer's house being somewhere between the main house and the mill. So this gives us an idea that the overseer's house was somewhere in this area. But then when we start to do our excavations, 
We've done metal detector surveys that define where the concentrations of artifacts are. We've gone in and put excavation units. So with the excavations in this area, <clears throat> kind of the, the size of excavation units we've done so far is this scatter shot of units where shovel test pits indicated features and the metal detector survey indicated concentrations of artifacts. And what we're doing with these units, literally right now, the expedition uh, uh, and the crew are out there today doing this work, is we're looking for these features that show up against the red clay. And then using this information that Taylor and I have been talking about, is this a squared off feature versus a round feature to begin to understand where could the structure be? So in the case of this area, we've got a collection of features that would love to have you all interpret. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna zoom in here. And for example, we've got this feature right here that shows up in a unit. And when you click on this uh, from our field excavations, here's a, this is especially relevant. There's a picture of Taylor excavating this feature. When you look at the drawing of this feature, it appears to be square. So if you all were going to make a guess whether this is a borrow pit or a subfloor pit, which would you interpret this as? So this is a quiz you can take at home. Anybody could pipe up. So you can also send it in the chat. <laughs> yeah, Peggy, you're you're talking. Subfloor. <laughs> Subfloor pit, exactly. And that's what's gotten this very interested in this area right here, because as you know, subfloor pits are typically under a log structure. And what we've also got at the uh, at the overseer's house is this scatter of brick. It's right in this area, isn't it, Chris? You Chris is being blinded by the sun. He, oh, look, if you look at Chris, Chris, go ahead and say something so you'll be asked. Uh, okay, so uh, that picture of Taylor um that matt was just showing you that was um we don't have it open because that was from 2019 and 2020 but this unit here it was under that board and then all of those red flags in there and the mix of blue flags that is where matt's talking about the distribution of brick at the site but we're so close to it here you can actually still see how much brick we're already finding over here but there's way more over there um but yeah i won't uh, talk too much more <laughs> All right. Thanks, Chris. That was a great live at the uh, at the uh, at the site. So, and so going back to these features, one of the other ones that um, was found in uh, 2020 was this larger feature right here. That when you look at the uh, this shot right here goes around in this kind of ovoid shape, and yeah, I'd floating mean controls. Um, and if you look at this drawing right here, this drawing, we didn't find the edges of this, and this appears to be a large burrow pit. And again, that supports there being a log structure somewhere in this area. But as Chris just pointed out, you've got a concentration of brick in this area, which suggests a, a, um, a structure with a brick chimney, which is more typically associated with a frame structure that you know, might or might not have a subfloor pit, but wouldn't need clay chinking, you know, to line the chimney. So we've what we're you know using this these uh, these clues from the subfloor pits and the non-subfloor pits is we're able to begin to decipher some some hypotheses and questions to ask of the site. And so this year, what we're going to be doing is, like Chris mentioned, we're opening a number of units up open in this area to try to define whether there's a log structure in this location, and then more units over here to define where this potential uh, frame building is with a, um, a, a brick chimney. So these subfloor pits, I mean, they're, uh, I'm going to stop sharing screens now. These subfloor pits are important. Um, in terms of, um, you know, being able to, um, you know, uh, find where the, where the structures are. But then also, as Taylor mentioned, they're a great source of artifacts because in so many cases, they're full of hearth ash, which is dietary material that if it's thrown down slope, will usually wash away because your, your fine ashes are going to wash in a rainstorm. So all kinds of uh, opportunities with these. Um, 
and wanted to open up. Taylor, what do you have anything else to add? Uh, no, I think uh, it'll be exciting to see how the subfloor pits kind of lead us to figuring out the story of the overseer's site and using all these clues coming together will be super exciting, especially since I remember Hannah and I uncovering those features and being like, when will they excavate these? <laughs> 2023 is the year, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're very excited about this. But right. There's a ton of questions in the chat. Oh, uh, awesome, Mary. Sort of throughout, um, people have been adding uh, throughout the the conversation, and I know you've answered some of them, but uh, do you want to just sort of look through them, or do you want me to ask you? Yeah, if, do you know, we're, um, I see, oh, I see one, um, I hear, when I hear a kiln, I think of baking cooking. Um, it was just used for storing vegetables. It, it was a, a kiln as in terms of, probably a kiln in terms of keeping heat, in a very, you know, when it's cold in the winter time and keeping them from uh, from freezing. Because with your, um, you know, with your any kind of uh, food crops in the winter time, if they freeze, then they're and then thaw, they're immediately going to start rotting. Um, there's another question um, from Brian asking about the technology we use for digitization. Um, whether we're using commercial lidar scanners or consumer stuff like iPhones or iPads. Mm. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's one one thing we're going to be experimenting for digitizing the units. We're using iPads and basically using it uh, CAD style programs with the iPad to do the drawings. Um, but one thing that you're alluding to, Mary, is with the iPad, it also has um, a LiDAR technology with it. The newer iPads do. And so um, uh, Chris and Terry have been experimenting with scanning the units. And if you go to Chris's overseer's um, uh, blog, he or uh, story map, he's got an example of a scanned unit that he he's sent over to Sketchfab, which is this um, a 3D uh, sharing software where you can actually see the unit in 3D. And what we want to do when we excavate these features is literally scan them layer by layer. And then we'll be able to really be able to go back and look at these later on. And this is something we weren't able to do, you know, years ago with uh, um, when we excavated the other subfloor pits. And for those of you who are really interested in 3D digitization, while it's not units, we're going to be running another one of our historic preservation expeditions um, this year. So we did one um, in the spring. We're going to do another one in the fall. And a lot of what we're doing is doing 3D scanning of historic standing structures across the property. Um, and it was really cool to be able to scan both interiors and exteriors of the of those structures. So there's a little plug because um, and I'm taking notes, Mary. I'm going to put some links to all this stuff. The three excellent three models. Um, there's another uh, uh, another question in the chat um, from Lavera. Uh, where else in the world are such underground structures? Where are we seeing features like this in other parts of the world? Um, and particularly parts outside of uh, Europe and the United States. Are we seeing these in, in, in Africa, in Latin America, in the Caribbean? The, no? yeah, these seem to be unique to the, to the Southeast. I know in, uh, um, in the Caribbean, you don't have subfloor pits, uh, basically because you're, where you store your root crops is in the ground and they can be you know, kept fresh all year round. You have seasonality, of course, um, but these seem to be, um, you know, there there are vegetable kilns that are um, are associated with uh, uh, European traditions, and so and there is also Native American traditions of having, you know, underground storage of uh, of root crops. So it's probably an amalgamation of traditions, uh, you know, creolization of traditions coming together for these. Um, Patricia also asks. Do you know if there is significance to having a hearthstone from England as opposed to using local stones? Importing stones seems like an extravagance to me. Yeah, green stone is just a nightmare. I see you yeah, Taylor laughing at this one, this one, because like the, the green stone, you know, trying to make a flat surface out of that. You know, basically Native Americans would use um uh grind the stone to make a shape. But the the uh, European uh, stone probably a lot of this um, in the mid 18th century. There's a lot of stone that gets imported because the quarries in the U.S. A lot of them have not been you know as well established, 
And just with the supply, it's, it's easier to get these from England. Absolutely. Well, and even think if we think of shipping stones as an extravagance, but it would have been in part important part of ballasting a ship. So um, yeah. allowing the ship to, 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 to uh, sail at the, the proper depth. Um, Debbie asks, um, when would a subfloor pit be created before, during, or after the construction of a structure? I would imagine it would be uh, after, like Taylor, the subfloor pits that were in the cellar, we actually, those are actually between joists, which was interesting. So you yeah, get yeah. they're also narrow and rectangular because there's a wood floor built over them. And so they're fit perfectly between those joists. Excellent. Let's see. Anyone else have questions that they want to ask just in human form and not have me translate? <laughs> <laughs> or you can add them to the chat. Well, there's some good conversation um, in the chat as well, with folks having different ideas um, and suggestions. Um, I, if we've got four minutes left, um, I've already plugged one program, but I will take this opportunity to plug some more programs for you all. Um, the first thing is our archaeology expedition programs. You too can come dig holes that Chris showed you from his live uh, out at the site. Um, we still have spaces in our fall programs in um, uh, September uh, and October. So please take a look at the schedule, sign up for those, come out there and come dig with us. We're working on our calendar for next year. Um, also, we've got some, uh, our next Lunch and Learn is going to be um, in the middle of June. Um, and if you like the little sort of sneak peek you got from Chris today, you're gonna love that. So on June 14th, we're gonna do live from the excavation site. We'll be in the middle of our field school. And so you'll be able to see what's coming out of the ground sort of in real time and um, seeing uh, the site. So please join us for that. The other thing that's gonna be going on in June, if you um, wanna start uh, 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 eating dinner and learning rather than lunching and learning, um, every Thursday in the month of June, we're gonna be working with the, um, Montpelier is working with the Orange County African-American Historical Society the Art Center in Orange, as well as the Montpelier Descendants Committee to do um, a Juneteenth celebration all month long. And every Thursday evening, we will be having a panel discussion on different topics relating to freedom. And our very own Dr. Matthew Reeves is gonna be in the first panel um, talking about uh, landscapes and the natural environment. And he's gonna be on this amazing panel um, with local farmers, um, uh, oral historians, and a really wide variety of how we look at landscapes through, through multiple lenses. And that will be on June 1st. So um, keep checking your email for those links, check for social media, but we will see you at the very least um, next month uh, for our Lunch and Learn on the 14th, and hopefully every Thursday throughout June um, for our Juneteenth programs. And we're going to uh, also start the live from the fields back. We'll put that what day we're going to do that um, in the um, in the next newsletter coming out. And one one plug for the fall programs is this year, the fall programs are going to be really exciting because when we get into the fall, we're going to have so many features revealed and excavated uh, in you know September and October that you're going to be able to see a lot of progress at the overseer's site. So we're, um, I'm, I myself am excited for the fall programs because we'll have all kinds of things to see. So, but um, well, thank you all so much for tuning in today. I will send a recording out. And when I send that recording out, I'll also put some of the links like Mary was talking about with the um, 3D uh, models that we just, that, uh, that we, the Royal We, that Tessa Honeycutt completed of the two structures we drew as part of the preservation program. And um, and then also some links to some of the um, uh, work that we, we did in the cellar and some of these other sites for subfloor pits. So thank you so much for being here today. And Taylor, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. You, you, you've got a crazy amount of work to do as a graduate student. It was really very, very wonderful of you to come out and, and do this program with us. So. Yeah, I was glad, yeah. To, glad to be back. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody. Well, have a good afternoon. Thanks, Taylor. It was good to see you. Thank you all.